I, I joke, I say I'm genetically engineered to teach trading because my father is actually a retired stockbroker and my mother is a retired school teacher. You know, so if you blend the genes of the, the broker and teacher together, that's what you're gonna get. <laughs> How are you feeling when you see prices go above that? Remember, you sold already and you could have sold at a higher price. That's not feeling very good, is it? Knowing that you could have sold for more, would you sell there again? The market doesn't hold anything personally against me. It doesn't care who I am or what I do. I do. I, I make those mistakes. Hi, my name is Jason Raznick, the CEO of Benzinga, and welcome to the Raz Report. As always, before we kick things off, I want to quickly tell you about what Benzinga is. Before I started Benzinga in 2010, there were very few places to get real-time information on financial markets. I thought it was unfair that Wall Street had access to this information before the average Joe investor. So I created Benzinga to level the playing field for you, the retail investor. Benzinga is for the people and by the people. Now, let's dive into the show. All right, welcome to this week's edition of the Raz Report. Excited to have Brandon Wendell, uh, CMT, chart guy, all this stuff, market technician. We're going to start first, but what is a freaking CMT? A CMT, uh, well, basically, it's Chartered Market Technician. And I think there's probably about 4,500 of us now. It's grown quite a bit. It's been around uh, the market technicians. Well, actually, now they changed the name to Chartered Market Technicians Association. They've been around since 1973. And um, basically, same age as me, actually. My birthday is next week. Um, but uh, they, we, it's basically a master's degree in technical analysis. So we've kind of learned all the different techniques and uh, ways of analyzing the charts. Probably learned more ways than I definitely needed. <laughs> But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much what it is. I call it a master's degree in technical analysis. So when you were in high school, did you like say, hey, I want to be a CMT or like or were you in the stock market? How, how did this come about? It, it was kind of a fluke, to be honest with you. In high school, yeah, there was a civics teacher I had that I'll never forget. And he had the stock market game and we would actually try to build portfolios and then we would use the newspaper the next morning to see how our portfolios did. Um, so it kind of got a bug there. And then, uh, I was in the military when I got out of the U S Navy, I ended up, um, working in a completely different field, but that didn't work out for me. So I became a stockbroker. I mean, it was back in the late nineties. So you had, um, you know, the movie boiler room and Wolf of wall street that, you know, people watch that for entertainment. For me, those are flashbacks. <laughs> I kind of yeah, got into yeah. penny pushing when I first got started. I was at a, a small brokerage that did that kind of work and ended up moving into back office operations. Cause I really didn't like the front end sales. I ended up really liking the trading and figuring out where the markets were going to go. So I worked as a, they call it agency desk operator. So they put me on the desk and I handled order flow dealing with market makers. Got it. Okay. So you were on the front side of like a uh, financial advisory firm. Yeah. But then you like being on the back end side, doing the trading, market makers, that kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. It was more my speed. I didn't want to deal with the sales. I wanted to deal with the markets and figure out, you know, is it going to go up, down? How do we get the orders filled best? Okay. So now I got so many questions. <laughs> so then, then did you get into technical analysis or? Yeah, I started. What happened was uh, I was hired to work for a private hedge fund and I was living in uh, San Diego at the time. So it was a private hedge fund in La Jolla, California, which is kind of the financial hub of the Southwest. And I was sent to a school to learn technical analysis and trading and ended up doing pretty well with it. So it's something that just kind of clicked for me. I, I, I enjoy reading charts. Believe it or not, I was a chartist in the Navy in a way. I was what they call a quartermaster which is navigation and charting. So different kind of charts, but it's still the same concept. And uh, yeah, so I ended up taking to it pretty well, traded for the fund for a while, left the fund, started trading for myself and um, had some troubles. I mean, it, honestly, it's a lot different. You probably know trading your own funds versus trading somebody else's money, OPM, other people's money is so much easier. So I ended up going back to that school so many times that they gave me a part-time job to help out as an assistant I found out that, you know, I kind of like this whole teaching, trading and technical analysis stuff and then and made a career out of it. I, I joke, I say I'm genetically engineered to teach trading because my father is actually a retired stockbroker and my mother is a retired school teacher. You know, so if you blend the genes of the, the broker and teacher together, that's what you're going to get. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, I understood. So, but then, so, but. You want to be the behind the scenes guy, but I'm, you know, I'm looking at you in the screen. You got the bow tie. You have the nice backdrop. I mean, you just have a nice, like, you look like you're more of a front end personality. Well, now, I am. Yeah. I, I kind of uh, enjoy the, the front end and the TV 
aspect of it. I've been on CNBC, Bloomberg, and you know now the Res Report. So definitely making my way up to the top, right? <laughs> but yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, so you no, enjoy. I, just, I enjoy too. mixing both of those. To be honest with you, I enjoy the technical work and the grunt work, figuring out what the markets are going to be doing. But I really enjoy helping other people doing it as well. So I enjoy being in front of the classroom and uh, you know kind of being a showman in a way, but also at the same time, really helping people improve the quality of their own lives. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you, before you're doing what you're doing now, you worked for Online Training Academy many years ago? I did. Yeah. That's where, that was a school that got me started. And I, again, I went, worked for them for about 20 years. Now I'm with a different outfit. I actually kind of uh, independent, but I'm with Wealth Builders HQ. And I, I still teach the futures markets. I do a little bit of options as well. I actually do SPX options, zero days till expiration every day for cash flow, as well as uh, wealth spreads. Um, actually, I look at uh, future spreads. So not just options, but also future spreads, which is kind of a niche product. Not everybody does that. Yeah, got it. So future, we'll get to, we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, I, you know, I have, cause we started talking through email and I definitely have like trading questions, market related questions, how you do go about that. And we will get to that and what you do on a current basis, but I'm right now just going to go more with a little macro. So some value investors, um, including Warren Buffett believe that charts may not matter. Why are they wrong or why are they right? Well, I think they're absolutely wrong. Charts definitely I matter think. because what's happening is everything that's known or knowable about a security is going to be reflected in that chart because what people think about a market will lead them to take action. And basically once they take action, that action they've taken is literally shown on the chart. I mean, every trade that ever occurs on any security gets shown on that chart. So we're looking at a, a two pictures really on a chart. One, we're looking at a picture of what have people done? What do they actually think about the security? Are they bullish? Are they bearish? Are they neutral? Are they maniacs? Are they are they panicking? And then more importantly, where are the unfilled orders? And you know, tra charting is is a, a lot of psychology. It's understanding mass psychology. You know, I mentioned mm -hmm. uh, when I got into this business before I did, I was in a completely different line of work, and I was in security and law enforcement. Believe it or not, um, I graduated police academy back in 1996 before I became a broker. Were you, yeah. were you in the movie? No, no, no. Police Academy? <laughs> I wish. That'd be fun. I, I, I'm, I, I'm joking. Yeah. I'm joking. That was my joke. Uh, I get a face for radio, actually. But um, so well, you have the bow tie and one of the guys in Police Academy wore a bow tie. Right. I forget yeah. which one. Yeah, I don't no, know which I one. Like the but that, guy, said, um, what's his name? Michael something. Yeah, remember. yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that guy. That yeah. was he was the best. I wish I. I wish I could do those sound effects. <laughs> yeah, I can't either. But uh, anyway, where are we going with this? Yeah, I was in the to complete the line of work. And um, I don't know. I don't remember where I was going. <laughs> oh, yeah. Talking about psychology. One of the courses I took was about uh, dealing with masses and mass psychology. I was actually a psychology major um, and a law enforcement uh, uh, minor in um, criminal justice. But anyway, I, we had to focus on mass psychology and mass psychology really moves markets. Understanding what the masses are thinking about a security or about a market in general will actually guide them to take action. Like I said, their actions could be predictable. And that's the main thing. If you can identify what the big institutions are doing and also what the masses are doing and see their footprints on a chart, then you can predict what's likely to occur in the future. There, you're nobody's ever going to be 100% correct. That's impossible. Okay. But we can have a high probability based on what we see on those charts. Okay, but so sometimes people will say chart, you know, looking at charts, you know, it's a lot of 2020 hindsight, like predicting the future. Do you ever like, I mean, I'm sure you do. So you're a chartist, right? And you're looking at charts. Do you look at the results? So if you're right, if we were right now looking at charts right now, do you ever like, okay, you'd say, I'm. let's say you'd say I'm buying Crocs. And it's a, it's a the charts telling me I need to buy it now because it's breaking out to a 52 week. Well, we're going to go more into your strategies, but do you look at your stats to say, okay, I was wrong here, right here, wrong here, right here, and then see how that performs versus like the S and P. Well, I mean, if I'm looking at individual security, I, there's several things like when you mentioned Crocs, or for instance, yeah, I can look at the individual stock, I can look at the sector, I can look at the markets, and there's different influences on each. My basic premise comes down to a uh, basically looking for what we call supply and demand. Most charts, yes, and, oh, good, and that's a bit. So what, before you go into that, so yeah, here's how we started talking. So I said, hey, so you know, uh, 
are there ideas you can bring here? And you go, yeah, sure. I've been following the supply and demand core strategy instead of support and resistance. Right. There really is a difference. And it has been great for my personal train as well as my students. I also use an R I also use RSI in a different manner than what is traditionally written about. There are many tricks and tips I would be happy to share that I've learned in the markets and film uh, fellow instructors. So if you want to go into your first thing about supply and demand, if you want to pull up a chart or what have you, feel free and I'll just go my, I'll, I'll mute my screen. Like I'll not mute it. I'll, I'll hide my, my face or radio and you could show whatever you want. If, that's, <laughs> oh, if okay. that's easier or whatever, whatever is good for you, my man. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a couple of things I've done on, uh, well, I tweet quite a bit. If you want, ever, anybody wants to follow me, I'm at trader B dub on Twitter. Um, wait, so wait, hold on. You said uh, spell it because you at know, that's trader B dub. It's at the yeah, at and then trader T R A D E R B as in boy, yep. D as in David, U B as in boy. So trader perfect, B -dub. perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay, yeah. I don't know if we on this video thing can you share a chart right? I don't know. If yeah, I think listening. I can. Let me see. Uh, uh, share okay, screen. If you can, can do that, and I'll move and I'll move me to I'll be here in audio, but I'll just turn my video off so you the uh, people can listen better. There we go. See I better. I share my screen now. Yeah, you're doing. Oh no, that's perfect. Actually, this okay. is good. Yep. So anyway, right, yeah, I mentioned Crocs, so I bring that up. Anyway, I'm uh, looking at a daily chart and, and just and, and explain and explain it like we're talking to fifth graders or sixth graders. Absolutely. Okay? Just assume so, that. Are you seeing your chart right now? Okay, yeah, there it is. Yeah. So basically, what happens is when I'm looking at a chart, and it could be anything, I am looking for where are the institutional orders, and more importantly, where are the leftover orders? Because when you're an institution, I mentioned I did this for the hedge fund, and I also did it for the brokerage as a back office you would actually uh, try to do what's called working the order. So for instance, if I was buying Crocs, I would be, obviously in the past, I would be looking for an area that a price range where we believe that this is a good value and that's where we would buy. So what happens though, is you can't buy everything you want all at once. You actually have to do what's called legging in and working the order. Because if you try to buy you know, millions of shares all at once, or even hundreds of thousands of shares, you're gonna move the market too quickly. So instead, you you know throw a bunch of orders out there. So for instance, like right here, uh, it's not the best example to be honest with you, but there's an area right here where prices kind of went sideways for a little bit, and then okay, they gapped hold on, hold up and so ran up. What, hold on, when you say prices went sideways there, why did they go side? Like, how do you know that went sideways there versus the seventeenth, like down here where it says October seventeenth? Did they go sideways there? They were as going well, sideways right here there? as well, but it's more importantly is how it leaves that area. We're going sideways because we have small candles or mixed colors in the candles, red and green. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. What are candles? The candles? I mean, I know what candles are, <laughs> but just tell people what candles are. Okay. Again, fifth graders. Okay. Fifth graders, don't Great. assume. Basically, what's happening with the with every chart, you are getting these divided up into periods. The chart period that I'm viewing right now is one day. So each one of these little blocks you see on my screen represents one day of price action. And what happens is we have four prices that are being displayed. The opening price at the very beginning, the very first trade that occurred for that security during that time frame. that's the open. Where, where is the opening trade at the bottom on it that depends on the, It depends on the color that I'll get to that in a moment. The next one is gonna be okay. the highest price we reached. We have the lowest price okay. we reached and then the closing or the finishing price during that particular time period. You can change to whatever time period you want. I, hate, I mentioned I'm on a daily chart. I can go down to a 15 minute time frame. Now, each one of these blocks represents 15 minutes. Now, the color okay. tells us whether we closed higher or lower. So what happens mm. if I go back to the daily chart, for instance, this green candle that I'll put an arrow above right here. That green candle lets me know that the buyers were in control during that period. Reason why is because a green candle, the body of the candle, which is the shape that's colored in, the piece that's colored in is called the body, or the, sometimes it's called the real body. And then you have the pieces that sometimes stick out on top and bottom. Those are called wicks or shadows or tails. Okay. I'm learning. Shadows or tails. Wicks, shadows, or tails. Okay. Yeah. And those, who creates, who creates these low. things? Wicks. Yeah, they're wicks Great. like a candle, obviously. That's why we use wicks for the term. I mean, this is charting 101, right? Sure. Like, absolutely. is this charting 101? Basics. We got, the we got we got Professor Brandon <laughs> Wendell, and he's not a professor, but 
To me, he's a professor. Okay, he's a CMT, a certified market technician. There's only 4,500 of them. So yeah. you're getting the best of the best here, doing this for many years. Yep. Keep so it going, man. I, case, I never really understood this stuff. Okay, so with the green candles, the opening for the period is the bottom of the body. And then what happened, okay. oops, I forgot to put a space there. So the open is the bottom of the body, and then with the green candle, the close is the top of the body. So whatever price okay. correlates with either that close or open. So in this case, we opened at the bottom of that green candle right there. We actually made the low okay. all the way down where the bottom of the wick is. But eventually, when prices close, it closed much higher. So a green candle tells us that the buyers are in control. Buyers are in control. Okay. They're dominating because they were able to push prices upwards. Now, the red candle is just the opposite then, because if the green is buying pressure, then red is going to be the selling pressure. So with these candles, and I'll just move this out of the way, red but candles. On that one, you're looking at, the, is, is the wick on top? No, the wicks could be on either side. It doesn't matter. The wicks are- Oh, I see. I see. Highs and lows. I see there's one on the bottom. So on that red one there with the wick at the bottom, that means they it, it hit a low of the day or started Correct. at the low? What's that mean? It means that we then opened when the at the top of their body. So again, they open is the top of the body. And in this case, the close is the bottom of the body. Oops, and I can't spell today. There we go. And basically, the wicks are showing us where we made our highs and lows, but we couldn't stay there before the finish. So the, in this case, sellers are in control. Okay. Whenever you see red, typically sellers are in control. There's actually, I mean, there's a lot more to this and I'll have time to go over. And this is a, these are things yeah, that I teach I know. in my courses. You know, when it comes to candles, there's really four key things to look at. One is color. The next one is shape. Another is size. And we also have what's called location. So if you can understand those four key things when it comes to, I spelled shape wrong, but that's okay. Uh, if you can understand right. those four things, you can really understand where price is likely to go. So these wicks, yeah, this let's take this red candle, for example. It opened at that okay. top of the body. It made a low down here, but couldn't stay there. And we ultimately closed at the bottom of the body. So the sellers were dominating because we did close lower than we opened, but there was a little bit of buying pressure during that period. That's all. And that's overall, that, that's what that means. Yeah, that's all that means. And then basically the reason why I said this was kind of a sideways period is because the very end of that period, you can see this was the beginning of that period. There's the end of the period. We barely moved in comparison to where we've been moving in the past. So that's why I said initially prices seem to have moved a bit Got sideways it. there because I'm looking at where do we open, where do we finish? And because we also have small size candles, there's a bit of indecision. Either one of two things happened. Either nobody really cared and nobody traded, or there was a lot of buying and a lot of selling pressure, but they were pretty equal, so we didn't go anywhere. Now, the next area right here, you see that gap up in a green candle. There was an imbalance there. There was somebody who wanted to buy, but because there's nobody willing to sell, the only way you can buy is if somebody sells to you. So if nobody wants to buy, nobody wants to sell to you, the, the only way you'll get sellers is if you're willing to pay more, right? And the right, same thing, right. If it works in housing markets, it works in widgets, it doesn't matter. If there's a bunch of sellers and nobody wants to buy, prices will drop as the sellers try to attract buyers. So we're looking for that imbalance, the origin of imbalance, and it's usually caused by big institutional orders. So in the case here, we gapped up and ran up because this is an area where there are not a lot of buyers. I'm sorry, take that back, other way around. There are not a lot of sellers in this area, but somebody was wanting to buy. Well, if there's no sellers in this area before, think about it, if you did sell at this price level, let's say you sold at $86.50 here, right in this area. How are you feeling okay. when you see prices go above that? Remember, you sold already, and you could have sold at a higher price. That's not feeling very good, is it? knowing that you could have sold for more, would you yep, sell there yep, again? Yep, yep. If you if you felt pain, the anguish of, of having been able to have sold for more, would you, you would sell be, there again? You would, be, 
you'd be less likely because you'd want to not you'd want to get that gain again. Exactly. You know, like so that means when we come yeah. back to that area, there's less likely to be any se- uh, sellers in that area. So that's do come back. So that's where your te- so that's where technical analysis plays a role. Exactly. I'm just going off basic human behavior. Never came back anyway, but. In that case, that may be an area where there were no sellers before, there was an imbalance, and when we return back to that imbalance, there's a high probability the same thing will happen. It's the pain and pleasure okay. principle. We repeat pleasurable experiences, we try to avoid painful ones. That's it's, uh, that's where technical analysis comes in place. Absolutely, that's all we're looking for, human behavior and understanding that behavior and that repetition of that behavior. Uh, the main thing that I'm looking for with supply and demand is where are the imbalances? Where did the institutions try to place their big orders? And remember, they're like big elephants. If you go into the jungle, you can walk through a jungle on your own and try to whack your way through with a machete. You're going to get beat up by the branches. It's going to be tiring. Or you can walk behind an elephant. If you walk behind the elephant, you just got to watch your step because they could, you know, big droppings. But <laughs> if you walk behind the elephant, they're going to blaze the trail for you and it's going to be much easier for you. You just got to make sure you're not following a tiger and you get too close. So you got to get the right path. And these elephants, no matter how lightly they try to tiptoe in the markets, they're going to leave big footprints. And those footprints are what I'm looking for. There are patterns that I look for in the markets that show me these were the institutional orders. And this is where they're likely to repeat to get the rest of their orders filled. And that's what technical analysis really is. And, you know, I can look at anything. I can look at the the NASDAQ, for instance. We have the ETF called the Q's. And I would look for the same patterns, uh, areas where there were prices of an imbalance that caused prices to change direction or pause before they accelerated again. And I don't see any in particular right through here right now. I mean, maybe something like this where we we went down a little bit, gapped up and ran. But you see, we only barely paused there before going through. So there's another dimension, which is... Uh, trend. So we have to combine that supply and demand with trend. And that's where I mentioned the RSI that's below here. That helps me out as well. So uh, if you want to, you know, I can go into that a little bit as well with the RSI, the way I said, because you mentioned, I use it a little bit differently than most people. Most people use what are called oscillators. There's really only two groups of technical indicators. You've got indicators and oscillators for the most part. Indicators typically measure momentum while oscillators are supposed to measure what they call overbought and oversold. But I don't like that because if you're overbought, you can become more overbought. We call that a bullish trend. And if we're oversold, we can become more oversold. We call that a bearish trend. So to me, when I'm looking at the, and RSI, by the way, if those are people are not familiar, it stands for relative strength. Relative strength index. indicator or index index or index or indicator it's really it's synonymous okay and most people look at it like i said for overbought oversold i don't look at it that way i look at it as a momentum indicator to measure momentum if you think about it this way if you're in a strong trend you really want to see price momentum behind you if the momentum is building that trend's likely to continue and if it's not then the price is likely to change direction so as an example, uh, for the RSI, the midpoint that I use is 50, which basically means that the momentum is sideways. There's no, there's no advantage to the buyers or sellers. However, if we start seeing a lot of bullish activity, I use 60 for what is normally overbought. And that shows me that the buyers are strong. So the higher this indicator goes, the more bullish momentum you have. You can see on the right-hand side of the screen right here, we're moving up quite a bit in a nice strong uptrend. RSI is going well above 60. That's the top of the shaded area right here. And it will not, in a bullish trend, price will not go into the bearish side, which by the way, for the bearish side, that is below 40. So 40 okay. is oversold. So, but, but, so why, wait, why are you saying 40 though? Why, like, I got what you're saying of the midpoint, but where, where's the 40 coming in? Is it because you're well, looking at just from experience. right there, that little space? Okay. So that's experience. Right. Yeah. It's just from experience and seeing which ones, which levels work. I'll be honest. There was a book I read many years ago by another CMT 
uh, Constance Brown, and she wrote about uh, using 40 and 60 on the RSI versus 70 and 30, which is their traditional overbought, oversold signals. And through my own practice, I've been doing this for about, I would say 17 or 18 years with this RSI, I found it's a better way of interpreting the data rather than the traditional method. So right here, as we're moving up, the buyers are very strong. You can see, as a matter of fact, the last time that we went below 40, you can see there was a low right here. We did not. And there's that low correlating on the RSI. Back here, we're below 40. Notice when RSI is below 40, and again, what does that mean? It means the sellers are very strong. Well, if the sellers are strong, we shouldn't be able to go up and make new highs. And you look back, there's a high. We were below 40 right here. We could not go up and make a new high. We pull back. The most recent high now is there. But we're not below 40 anymore. The sellers are no longer very strong, are they? And what happens? Price Got came it. up and tested Got the high. It. Now it breaks out. So, so, so then I guess, I guess here's a question I have then. So if I'm looking at a fundamental trade, let's like say I have a belief on Tesla at one point okay. and I, and I look at your oversold, your sellers are strong. So you believe that the support's there, but what if this story changes when earnings comes out and they forecast such a higher number, doesn't the levels change dramatically if they're, no. if their earnings, why? Because if the well, earnings are going to be higher, doesn't that mean that the company has more earnings and you do a discount of cash? You know what I mean? You got to realize, remember, again, what I'm looking for is what are the institutions doing? Most of those institutions have people who are dedicated to learning exactly what those earnings are likely to be going forward. And they take positions based on what they think is going to be released for those numbers. So unless there's a major surprise, most of that gets priced in a lot before. For instance, here's Tesla you mentioned. I got Tesla on a chart here. And here we are just before an earnings release. There's the earnings release date, which was supposed to be Wednesday, the 20th. And right, right. the surprise okay. was a positive. Looking, so yeah. they, they beat earnings, right? Well, notice where the yep. momentum is before they beat earnings. We did not go into bearish territory. So we're seeing bullishness. We're making new highs. We're actually just before 60, right before those earnings come out. Everything's pointing upwards. The earnings came out and all we did was just keep going. So the markets were already, they will tell you what's going to happen a lot of times before it even happens, even with Fed announcements. Major announcements, for the most part, a lot of them can be predicted. Yes, there's always going to be what they call a black swan event where nothing it yep. wasn't predicted, it just happened. But the majority of the time when you have earnings, especially on something as big as Tesla, there are going to be institutions that are kind of hinting at what they believe will happen. They've analyzed it to death before the numbers even come out. So what happens, breaks out, pulls back to shake out the weak players and then rallies. It's a typical pattern. And if anybody was a technical analyst, they might've seen this as what they call an ascending triangle pattern prior to that news. So again, right there, that everything right there that I see is pointing to bullishness. We're getting more and more buying pressure before the breakout. So it does get predicted. Okay. It's pre technical analysis is predictive. I don't discount fundamental analysis 100%. I do believe it has its purpose. Fundamental analysis is a lot like the weather report. It tells you what to expect. What, what environment are you operating in? But technical analysis gives you the timing. It tells you when to open the umbrella. But you had that umbrella because you watched the fundamentals and knew that there was likely to be rain. Okay. Yep. I get it. I get it. And that's where... So the, so you, do you think someone not doing technical analysis is just truly like operating blindly then? Well, I, I think they can't. Yeah, I, I honestly, I think it's kind of silly to not do any technical analysis when it's available to everyone. You just obviously have to learn and learn hopefully the right way because there's a lot of different materials out there that are good. Some are bad and that's with everything. But, uh, yeah, to just follow fundamental analysis, I think you're missing out on being able to fine tune your entries and get better returns is really what it comes down to. If you get a better entry, you accept less risk in the markets and greater rewards. If I can time my entries better. Uh, fundamental analyst who does that solely, yeah, they can still do well in the markets because they'll know what to expect and what's likely to happen. But again, the technical analyst or somebody who mar marries both will actually al almost always do better in my eyes because again, they know what to expect and when to expect it.
And I think I just think that's a bit, Got it. bit better. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's and, and and also the other part is you can trade on sentiment of technical analysis, right? Like you can you can do the opposite of what you think where your support levels are. I don't know how likely it is. So do you do a lot of testing then of like after the fact saying, okay, I have this prediction because of this is what the charts are showing me. Do you do a lot of back testing or seeing if your predictions were right, et cetera, et cetera? Well, yes. I mean, I have a lot of people that follow me as well. So I have a responsibility to make sure that what I'm doing is, is accurate to a certain extent. I'm never going to be right 100% of the time, but I take, I take notes and I keep track of everything I do. I uh, take a look at why did I take a particular position? I used to, believe it or not, I was very into, big into behavioral finance, the psychology behind the traders. And I also would actually record my psychological, um, kind of my well-being, if you will. What kind of mindset was I in when I took certain positions to try to recognize things that are mental deficiencies, if you will, in myself? What could I do to improve myself so I could be uh, more in the Zen or more in the moment, if you will. So that way I'm trading the right way and not trading based on revenge or emotions. Emotions are a killer. So if you can recognize when those are coming in and being a detriment to yourself, you're actually going to become a better trader. If you can control that technical analysis should be very objective and objectiveness and repetitiveness. We need consistency. So a couple things. One, you have to have a written plan that you follow. And that will build that consistency. I don't go into the markets just randomly picking out ideas and trading them. If I find something new, for instance, I created a strategy many years ago called my 889 strategy using a couple of moving averages. And I tested it for a while. Now, I don't really go back and back test a lot, partially because um, a lot of back testing is flawed because people back test in environments that they may not be trading in in the future you got to realize markets go through different environments bullish markets bearish markets uh, recessions expansions things like that and you've got to make sure that whatever strategy you're trying to test is going to be tested in the same environment you expect going forward so usually what i'll do is i'll just test it either in a simulated mode or with small amounts of money just going forward with it and if it's working out, great. If not, at least because I've been following a plan, I can now tweak certain things and know I can get a direct result. You know, it's experimentation. I form a hypothesis. I test the hypothesis before it can become a theory. And it's the same thing when it comes yeah. to my trading as well. So, yes, I will look back to see how did these work a little bit. But for the most part, I really do what call, I call it forward testing or live testing. Got it. So then, wait, I want to go back to your 889 strategy sure. for a second. Did, wait, why was it called 889? Well, yeah, I can show my screen again and uh, let me see here. There we go. Uh, it's basically called that because I use two moving averages, 8 and 89 exponential moving average. And I'm not going to go into uh, the whole thing right now because it's going to take some time. But let me see, remove drawings. Basically, what I'm looking at, uh, there's a theory in the markets called Elliott Wave. And it goes all the way yep. back actually to Charles Dow in the late 18, 19, or early 1900s that markets move in waves. So with this 889, what I'm trying to do is capture wave three because often when markets move, they move in three waves. So let's see, Tesla was moving on a downtrend there. It did never it didn't ever retest after a, a crossover here, but it did kind of make there's wave one, oops, two, three, four. Oops, can't get it there. Four. And let's do this. Five. Yeah, don't need that one. Anyway, you can see it did a five wave move and then corrected. So with my 889, typically the third wave is not the smallest. I do it, drew it out the smallest. I might have made an error in my drawings, but typically the third wave is either the same as one or five or it's the longest wave. So my 889 strategy attempts to capture the second wave. I'm sorry, third wave, not second, third wave. These are labeled basically one. This would be two. And it would take me a while to label all those, but two, then I'd have three to the downside right here. And 
that's what I'm trying to capture typically is that third wave, which happens to be the strongest one, typically, not in this case. <clears throat> then I had four back here and five down, and then we start over again with another set of waves. But for instance, right now, it looks like we're correcting after a move up. So I'd be ready to look for a buying opportunity in Tesla. I'm going to basically look for my area of demand, where to buy. I'm going to make sure the momentum is in my favor. And I would possibly buy on that first retest of that 89 moving average because these moving averages, you know, price is elastic. What, the, what price does is it stretches away from an average and snaps back to it. I mean, that's why it's the average. So using the yeah, correct yeah. averages, you should see movements away, back, move away, back. So I'm looking for it to bounce off the average, basically. Okay. Okay. So, so, so are there, you know, so like sometimes I, I'm going to go from a fundamental standpoint. I know I'm jumping around, but, uh, um, okay. We're with, we're with Brendan Wendell, chart, a chartered market technician, and you can follow him on Twitter. Say the Twitter name. Oh, it's at trigger B dub. I'll just put that out there. Yep. At, oops. Yeah, put it on the yeah, put it on the screen. So, um, sometimes I have a fundamental viewpoint about something's going to happen, so I make the trade, okay, and I go really strong into it. Mm -hmm. Like I um, Ozempic, and I was buying INMD. It went up forty percent. I made great money on it. Went up thirty percent. Whatever. Do you ever have a technical setup that you're so so convicted on like that your probability of success is like in your mind that this is the time where i gotta line up the boats and go in in in. do you guys do you get those kind of notions no because i'm, I'm always looking at basically when i'm doing a trade it doesn't matter if mm -hmm. position you know long-term trade short-term trade i'm always looking at both sides of the the coin both both yeah, basically the way i look at it is that i'm i'm a judge but i'm also the prosecutor and the defender and I got to present a case to the judge. Ultimately, the judge is going to make the trade or not make the trade. They're going to take it saying this is a really high probability and I'm going to put in a lot of money or a lot of positions on this or I'm going to put very little because I'm not as confident on this. But I have to make the ultimate decision. But I there's never been a time where I've yep. said, you know, this has got to happen. Uh, I always have, you know, what if in the back of my head, which means that no matter what I do, I also always have a, a stop loss in place. Because I am not in okay. I'm going to make mistakes. Just ask my ex-wife. <laughs> Actually, don't do that. Um, but that, that's I'm the thing. You. You know, there's, I've, there, I've had high confidence, yes. But I always look at both sides. What if and what are the possibilities that this could go wrong? What would happen? Now, you got to be careful because you don't want to paralyze yourself either. You can go the other way where you're thinking of too many negatives and now you won't take the position ever. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And then, cause you can always find, you can always find reasons, you know, to not make those trades. Sure. Okay. I know we have like a few more minutes left. I want to go to, were you found when the GameStop saga a couple of years ago and you know, um, and it was just, it was, it was just insane. Did that, um, throw technical, technical analysis out of the window, basically? Pretty much. I mean, I, yeah, I'm trying to look back at the charts on, GameStop. Actually, yeah, let me go ahead and share it again, I guess. Um, there it is, GameStop. And I'm on a weekly chart. And even before everything went berserk, uh, you know, GameStop right here, to uh, stop the decline, we actually started seeing some warning signs. This is going back. I don't remember the actual day of, you know, the explosion. I can obviously look at the charts here. Why is this not? There we go. I'm going to turn off those moving averages for right now. But you see, there's the big explosive move looking at about January of 2021. I did not personally take uh, advantage of any of that. I didn't, I did, I missed it completely, but you know, looking back, there's, it definitely was bullish before that happened. You know, I know it looks like it's going down, 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 but remember what I was saying about these indicators, this shows us momentum. And what's happening here is that prices were making downward moves, but the momentum wasn't there. Look at that. The momentum in this area, as price is moving down, I'll bring up the RSI a little bit bigger. That's going up. That means we're losing bullish gotcha. momentum. And then here, we're putting in a low. We're not below 40. So that's way before the, now, it didn't predict the explosive move. This was the initial thrust to the upside, which went from $1 to $4, 300% gain. That's pretty amazing. And it's still showing plenty right. of momentum. That means there's more out there. As a matter of fact, this would be an area of demand that I would look for right here for buying. 
There's another one just below it. So one of those two areas would be a great buy opportunity. And obviously the first one exploded. There were plenty of opportunities. Technical analysis did not go out the window in this case. It really, uh, it wouldn't have predicted this much of an explosive move, but it did predict the turning of the tide, so to speak. Now, as far as the big drop, got it, got it. parabolic moves like this never last. You know, what goes straight up? Airplanes can't fly straight up. I mean, maybe if you get enough thrust behind them, but in the typical airplane, once that airflow over the top foil breaks, you lose lift and you're going to stall. And that's what happens on, you know, market moves like that. If I go to the daily chart, it looks a little different, but again, same going back to 2021. So no, the technical analysis did not go out the window, so to speak, but there were definitely warning signs before this turned in both directions. Even here, you can see we went back up again. We still are bullish. Let's see, where did the bullishness snap? As soon as it gets below 40 on the RSI, that's when it's done going up right there. Okay. So now it still worked. I would so, say. so when, when have you, like, what was like your worst mistake in trading? My worst mistake in trading personally was when uh, Qualcomm went to a thousand dollars. I thought I tried shorting it. Uh, this is way back in the late nineties when the tech bubble hit. Uh, I think I lost $32,000 in 15 minutes on that personal money, not, not company money, other people's, um, you know, I was, believe it or not at the time, I actually played semi-pro hockey, uh, in line in ice hockey. And I had to, I played on okay. a team sponsored by Qualcomm of all things. So not only did I lose that money, but I had to wear the, the Q on my chest later that day. I felt more like an L. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh my God. So, Could that, you imagine? so, that, that, so, yeah, so you do you hate Qualcomm now? Nah, I, and that's the thing. It wasn't Qualcomm that did it to me. It was myself. You know, the, the market right. the market doesn't care. It was me and my ego thinking, no, I'm right. The stock is wrong. It's going to turn around eventually, and it didn't. You know, I was wrong. So you got to realize yeah. those things. The, the market doesn't hold anything personally against me. It doesn't care who I am or what I do. I do. I I make those mistakes. Nobody else does. I don't hate any securities. I don't have any particular securities. I know some people have their, their boogeyman security that they won't trade because it's hurt them so much. To me, I don't have anything because I know the only thing that's ever hurt me in the markets has been me. And I'm not going to hate myself. Yeah. <laughs> that's silly. No, no. I'm going to learn so that's from the, That's the way you look. That's the way you look at it. See, I, I get mad at the companies. No, nah, so I, 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 I just, I don't because there's no personal interest. In it. There's no reason. They don't care. The CEO of a company doesn't care right, whether you make money on their stock or not. Unless you're the biggest right. shareholder. If you're a Carl Icahn, yeah, then maybe they'll care. But other than that, they don't care what Brandon Waddell does. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, yeah, no, that's true. And so that's why it's just, it's, that's why they call it Mr. Market, right? Yeah. I mean, you just got to, well, I, I th honestly, I think it's Mrs. Market or Ms. Market because the market's a woman. I've never been able to figure it out completely. And when I think I do, she surprises me. So <laughs> that, I don't think I'll ever be able to figure it out completely. But it's a learning so, experience. That's the fun part of it is learning from everything that happens in the market, whether it be a positive or a negative. Um, yeah, it's just it's a it's a great experience that I'm I'm really happy to be a part of. No, I get it, and it's a challenge every day, and you wake up for it, and you've been doing it for twenty plus years, yeah. so it's not like you're just coming to this lately. Right. So, guys, I appreciate Brandon Wendell coming on. You can follow him on Twitter. Uh, he has education courses. Um, he's been doing this for years. It's not a guy who's just joined the market. So he's seen the ups and downs. So I, what I like about it is risk and looking at the downside and the upside because it's easy when it just goes straight up. And so, um, you know, thank you for coming on the Raz report. We'll have you on more, probably this, have this out in a week or so. Um, but again, thank you for coming on. And, uh, if you want more technical analysis chart, just let us know and we'll bring them on again. And this time we'll do it in a more organized thing we'll do a 101 then we'll do a 201 and who knows maybe we'll create a custom course for our listeners there we go that'll be fun well thanks you for know, having me i really appreciate I will it no thank you for coming on i really appreciate it as well